Today's episode is sponsored by the 2023 Rhode Island Business Summit, presented by Stella Business Concepts on September 21st at the Event Factory in Warwick, Rhode Island. Join us to connect with B2B vendors, amazing networking opportunities, and guest speakers like Patricia Raskin, who will talk to you about podcasting for your business, leadership with Mary Sullivan, or customer retention with me, Erica Sicoccio, and more. We have panelists, and we also have a very fun, amazing Lunch and Learn with Rhode Island comic Poppy Champlin. Tickets are on sale now. Visit our website at www.stellabusinessconcepts.com. See you there. Hey guys, it's Erica here with Practical Biz Podcast. I am super excited. We are rolling into season two um, with our guest here today, and we're going to talk about branding. I'm going to let him introduce himself. If you're from Rhode Island, you probably already have heard of his brand and might even already know him, but welcome to our show. Thank you so much, Erica, for having me here. Uh, my name is Victor Regino. I'm the CEO of Papi's Coquito. I also have two other partners who couldn't be here, unfortunately. Uh, Louis Almo, who's the CFO, and Travis Escobar, who's the COO. A little bit about myself. Uh, as Erica said, I own the liquor brand that's in front of us here today uh, called Papi's Coquito. Uh, and it was actually a recipe that was handed down from my grandmother. Uh, and I took it into myself and then I brought it to liquor store shelves and bars and restaurants all across Rhode Island. And hopefully soon moving into Massachusetts. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I'm super excited because we're both very much entrepreneurs, so we might go off script and we may end up not talking all about branding, but maybe just a lot about a lot of things. So um, so one of the things I find as uh, I think is really cool in our state is a lot of the people that I talk with that are entrepreneurs are very connected to their family, right? I think family drives a lot of businesses, um, but I think in Rhode Island we have something special going on that there are either people making businesses from past generations or people making businesses for current generations or future generations. So I think that that's something that's just uh, very much a, a Rhode Island thing for sure. Um, did anybody else in your family already own a business? Are you the first entrepreneur or are there many entrepreneurs before you? So that's a really good question. Actually, the same person, my grandmother, uh, who passed down the recipe to me actually was in business before um she and my grandmother was the first person who came down here really uh before the rest of the family came down here from dr and uh she had a sewing business so she was actually like a seamstress which i give her amazing credit for mm -hmm. because you know back in the day seamstress were you know they didn't get paid too much but she purchased a building outright and she you know did her seamstress thing and then once she got a little bit older she just stopped the business and then started going into real estate so she was the first I yes guess you want to say and then there's me so i don't i don't think that's uh, an accident so i i i find very similar uh experiences in in my life so my family um had many businesses up on federal hill um and actually uh, one of my cousins still owns frederick veal on federal hill um and um started with my grandfather. My cousin's a fifth generation butcher. Um, so yeah, so I think that that's just something that you see as a little kid and you continue to see as you grow up. And then it sparks something like, hey, there might be something to this, doing it myself, doing it my way. So. And when you have somebody that's so close to you that is you know, making something in themselves, it really does do something yeah. for you. It like lights a fire in you kind mm -hmm. of in a sort of way. And just to touch on what you said, even in Rhode Island, the Rhode Island market is fantastic because family is everything. And also, if you really look at the businesses that are thriving in Rhode Island, they have that close-knit kind of family culture. And mm -hmm. also, everybody loves to support in Rhode Island. Small businesses is yes. the biggest thing in Rhode Island. 
It absolutely is. Uh, maybe that's because we're the little estate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we, 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 there is something that we are very much proud of being small. Small but mighty, right? So let's talk a little bit about your brand and how did you come up with your brand story um, or not so much come up with, but were able to articulate that to everyone in your circle of where your brand is, what it, what it should say. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. So the brand itself didn't just happen. Right? And I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. um, branding, there's a lot that goes into branding. Really, the story is you have to, if you're going to be developing a brand and you don't have a story, it's it's really 99% of the time not going to not gonna work. It's not a brand. It's not a brand at <laughs> that point. It's not a brand. Exactly. You can make a product. doesn't mean it's branded, right? Exactly. And I think a lot of people really don't put too much time or effort into the story as much as they should because what's the difference between you and somebody else mm -hmm. all right so there's a couple of things that you have to do before you even get into branding you have to figure out what your brand style is going to be um i feel like i started with the brand style of what poppy Skokito was going to be i figured out you know all right so i have this product here what can i do with it i got to figure out what kind of style of the brand i'm going to have like is it going to be you know like is it going to be like an, uh, do I want it to become like a national brand? Do I want it to become just like a local brand? Uh, cause that can be a thing, you know, mm. your trajectory would really change depending on Absolutely. You local, uh -huh. if you want to move on to be national. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then after that, really there's like a lot of planning involved. Mm -hmm. So once you figure out what your trajectory is, I felt like the brand kind of like started to, uh, build itself in the foundation wise. So what did you and your partners decide? Did you decide you were going to try to do mass market or stay Rhode Island? So we're definitely going to be a national brand. Okay. And I think one of the reasons why we chose to do this was because there's only four Coquito brands in the whole mm -hmm. entire world. Okay. All right. I don't know if a lot of people know, but there are only three others besides us and we're here in Rhode Island. You know? Yeah. So, and the other three, you know, two of them are only found in Puerto Rico and then one, which is Bacardi, yep. distributes nationally. So- mm -hmm. The market's free and clear. Yeah. So I, I think, um, too, that I think you could easily do that expansion because, to me, it's it's a drink that I would imagine would make a cultural connection as well, right? And it, like you said, it's something that's passed down from generation to generation. So I think that that makes sense. Um, so you guys have a logo? Yes, yes. So the logo that you see on the bottle, mm -hmm. uh, it's actually very intentional. Okay. So, and just talk about it. Yeah. Um, if you look at the logo itself, mm -hmm. you'll have the the circle. You have the circle, and then you'll it'll say Papi's Coquito, and then it'll have a coconut right in the middle. Mm -hmm. If you look, like if you look from like a little bit further back, you'll see the the ring around the logo. It's a coconut it's looking inside of an, an actual coconut so not only not only will you um will you see the coconut in the middle mm -hmm. you'll also see the coconut just from the actual logo itself and the label itself we really wanted to focus on the tropical feel of it yeah you know i feel like coconuts are really tropical my nature. favorite drink, coconut. <laughs> I drink coconut rum, coconut anything. Coconut yeah. is is my go-to, uh, or coconut and pineapple. Those are things I I love. Yeah, makes me think of something warm and relaxing. Exactly, exactly. And we had the uh, we had to really go through uh, a few different things because coquito itself is really known mostly as a seasonal beverage. Okay, but there's nothing saying that it has to be seasonal. Mm -hmm. So we kind of had to also do some brand awareness okay. about what coquito is but then once people start to realize what coquito is we also have to put the education in that coquito isn't just you know for a seasonal beverage mm -hmm. you can uh, use it as a um, as a replacement for baileys so our product is a non-dairy oh. product so let's say you have somebody who wants an espresso martini mm -hmm. but can't do dairy you have an obvious choice right here yeah so how do you how do you currently spread that brand awareness like are you on youtube are you do you shoot videos like how do you how are you educating consumers so the way that we've done it and which i think has been very successful is through collaborations okay. um one of the biggest things with this brand is we're not going to be able to 
educate the consumer as much as somebody who maybe knows the consumer. You know, we know our consumer, like mm-hmm. our local consumer, yep. but there are going to be people who don't know who we are or don't know what Coquito is. Sure. So how do you get in contact with them? How do you, how do you outreach to them well, uh, by being genuine mm-hmm. through collaborations with uh, influencers or through collaborations with your local bars? So what we do for education and brand awareness is we, one, for the bars and the restaurants, we'll talk to the bartenders, tell them about the history of the brand, tell them what's in the, the, the liquor mm-hmm. and how they can use it and how they can get you know creative with it. Mm-hmm. The other aspect is using social media influencers. Uh, I'll do a shameless plug here. Yeah. Some like buns. That's what we're here for. Buns and bites and, yeah. and, and those type of influencers can help reach their consumer and tell them about Coquito so that next time they go into a bar, they see Coquito on the menu. They're like, oh. Don't know what it is. I know what it is. Yeah. Great. Um, so the colors, the fonts, how did you determine um, those? Really, we it's through our mood board. So okay. we received um, a playbook from, a, uh, from our marketing agency. And the mood board really kind of captured what we're looking for uh so the mood board really said hey you know this drink is best you know served in the golden hour golden hour is like sunset you know beach vibes so forth and you're out with your friends having an after dinner drink yeah that speaks volumes to what the brand is so we wanted to reflect that that. through the colors exactly exactly um and so your brand voice would be time with friends or relaxation you hit it right in the head so okay. uh celeb- celebratory well, i could see the bop yeah. <laughs> you did a good job <laughs> celebratory we we like to see it with you know let's say you had a you just recently got a promotion mm-hmm. you know we want it to be those celebratory occasions where it's like hey let's go out to eat and then let's go have some after dinner drinks and like let's cheers to your promotion we want it to be like surrounding with friends family you know celebratory yeah. Um, where can where is your brand presence now? Like, are you? I know you say restaurants and mm-hmm. like, so I can walk into a local liquor store and I'll find this on the shelf. Yeah. So in Rhode Island, just in Rhode Island, you can find us in local liquor stores. You can find us in bars, restaurants. So if you're really looking for the Papi Scoquito and you want to know where you can find it, mm-hmm. you can go to our website, papiscoquito dot com. And we have a store locator there. So mm-hmm. all you have to do is really just put in your address and then it'll tell you the closest, you know, place that you can purchase it, whether it be a bar, restaurant, or a liquor store. So this might be more of a marketing question, but a lot of small business owners, like how they're gonna wanna how did you get into a liquor store? Right? What did that process look like? Yeah, that process was not fun. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about that. So I, I totally understand why people don't Two liquor brands. I'll be completely honest mm-hmm. with you because you have to go through so many regulatory processes mm-hmm. in order to get to where you are. So when I first started, I was I, it was just me, my wife, a blender, and you know yep. all the products to make coquito. It's a little bit different when you want to go to scale and you want to get into liquor stores. Mm-hmm. So, like I said before, everything is intentional in this bottle. The labels have to get approved through the TTB. Um, my license, my liquor license in order to distribute alcohol needs to go through the TTB. So not only are you uh, investing money before you can even get any revenue from your brand, but you're also battling basically like regulations and government to get to where you are. So what I had to do first was a whole bunch of planning. There was planning that it went into it, and then I had to figure out who my demographic was. So I know for sure and confident once I actually get to market that I'm going to be selling. All right. So after you figure that out, then we need to make sure that people can locate us. So we went through a website creation. We got our website fully decked out as to, you know, what our needs were. And Mm -hmm. that's what we did. Um, Then once that happened, we went through regulatory agencies like TTB. So we got our R&D team, uh, research and development team to kind of deconstruct our homemade coquito Mm -hmm. to find out what we can do to kind of mass produce this process. Mm -hmm. Once we got 
our results from the R&D team, we then were sourcing products. So it was me trying to find coconut cream in bulk. Mm -hmm. Then trying you didn't go to stop and shop and go buy no. 200,000 gallons. It doesn't work like that. You got to buy it by 230 gallons. Yeah. Than, you know, maybe a yep. 750 milliliter. It's so finding some wholesalers. Finding yep. somebody who can, who can also be a supplier to you because you don't want, the last thing you want is to get a very niche product that, you know, mm -hmm. they're always running out. You can't have that. And supply chain supply problems chain. are right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we sourced all our products and our ingredients. Our research and development team uh, got the flavors for our product. And then what we did is we actually sent it to a co-packer. Mm -hmm. So our co-packer um, is the one who blends in bottles for us. Mm -hmm. It's our ingredients, our recipe, yep. our everything. Bottles, caps, labels, everything. I think our, um, our fourth or fifth episode we had uh, Maeve's Lemonade. I know you're familiar with them, but uh, they're also Rhode Island non-alcoholic. Mm -hmm. It's a lemonade, but it's also uh, has like a twist and it's kind of the same, a similar vibe, similar yeah. customer. And she talked to us a little bit about that process to the cold packer. And she also said, not yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah. Not fun at all. Uh, we actually went through two cold packers before we could find. Get the right. Our fit. one. Yeah. The first one was here local in Rhode Island. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. Mm -hmm had to get into a legal dispute and then after that we went to kentucky where they our product is very different and unique it's not like sure. any other product that's on shelves so they had no clue they was like hey listen we're not confident that we can do this so yeah you know find well that was else. good that they let you know up front right exactly yeah so then we found our final co packer who's been great and they've dealt with cream liqueurs before so uh, then once that was all taken care of, they blended, bottled, labeled, packaged it, sent it to our warehouse, which is located in Pawtucket. And then we got it into bars, restaurants, and liquor stores. Okay. Um, so you, you said something really interesting. I think it's really important, or can you stress the importance of finding the right people to work with? Because that really can be the make or break of your brand, right? Yeah. Now, if that company in, do you say Tennessee? In uh, Kentucky. Kentucky, sorry. Um, if they had, imagine if they had taken it and then started the project and then it wasn't right and that, that stuff went out, yeah. right? That could have like killed your brand. Exactly. So what would be your best advice on how to find the right people? Like you make it sound very easy, right? You're like, oh, my R&D guy, blah, 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 right? <laughs> but it, you, you, you made it very simple, but I know from being an entrepreneur, there is a lot more to that so did somebody help you even how did you even know about a research and development team right so right because somebody didn't yeah. your grandma didn't give you the recipe and you're like yeah i'm gonna get an rd <laughs> plan i'm gonna get right so right. how did you even know to do that um i you just do it honestly there's nobody that helped me with the r d process there's nobody that helped me with trying to find a co-packer it was really just and i think you touched on it um briefly in one of your other episodes where you build a team around you and you create a family yeah. All right. You know when somebody doesn't fit that family. So basically what I did was I like when we went to uh, Kentucky to check out the new co-packer, mm -hmm. I physically flew down there yeah. uh, to meet their team to see if they fit the family. Now, granted, they, they did fit the family. Sure. But it ended up not working out. Sure. So that's why yeah. like I had to. You can like a lot of people doesn't mean you're going to marry them all. Exactly. You got to find the right exactly. one, right? Exactly. So then after after that Kentucky situation, yeah, they were great. They were part of the family, but it just didn't click. And it's okay. Yep. So we moved on to the next one and they were great, still connected. But I'll tell you one thing. I will stress whenever you are building a team around your brand and your business, red flags are there. Mm -hmm. And you're noticing them, but you choose to ignore them. Ignore them. Mm-hmm you'll know if there's a red flag and that red flag, you should go with your gut. A hundred percent. So I, I think almost every business decision I've ever made, although calculated and intentional, um, my gut would tell me a lot of things. Um, and I really could connect with what you had said about in the beginning, you decide whether you want to be a national brand or a local brand. For me, it was the opposite. Um, I decided I wanted to stay a local brand. Yeah. I actually was getting myself up to scale 
we had six centers and we were talking about franchising. Mm -hmm. But for me, my family, for what I was doing, um, I went the other way. I said, you know, I'm going to double down on quality and keep my family centered nice and tight. And for me, that would make sense. So I think going with your gut as a business owner as what feels good for you and where you where do you see yourself in five years, 10 years, et cetera. So where do you see yourself in five years? <laughs> yeah, I see, well, I see the brand that it's going to be pushed over to Massachusetts, Connecticut, New okay. York. So we're going to be expanding in New England for sure. Yeah. Uh, it's just a matter of when. And, you know, maybe it's within five years. Maybe it's within two years. Who knows? But I, I do admire that you say, yeah, I push to be local because mm -hmm. Either way, even if you we're, we're entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. We can we excel in like situations yep. that you know other people can't. You can always change that. Mm -hmm. You know, you can always change your trajectory. It's just a matter of planning or, and strategic yeah. roadmap. Or even add to it. So yeah. my thinking in my head was because I am an entrepreneur, I didn't want to buy myself a job and I wanted to be able to also do other things that I enjoy. And I think when you scale something really big, that's what you're doing. Right. Where if you had something that makes you a profit that is smaller in size, it allows you to have a little more freedom and flexibility to also write a book, also exactly. do, you know, speaking gigs, you know, throughout the country. It allows you to do other things um, that you may not be able to do on a scale for my particular industry. Right. Every industry is different. <laughs> that too. Um, so how do you engage with your customer? Let's talk about brand brand engagement. So I keep things very organic and natural when with brand engagement because you can you can always, you know, force your brand on people who may not even, you know, buy your product and mm -hmm. the, the whole time. Um, I like to focus on collaborations where I find the person that, you know, somebody looks to for, you know, industry stuff. So I'll I'll find people in the industry who can kind of like tell our brand story so that's really the only way that i would engage and also by doing um uh, different types of events you know like tasting events yeah. for the brand so uh, we just recently did a, an event at taste of our eye and we went through probably like 10 <laughs> cases of I wish i was there <laughs> you know? it was it was an amazing event and we if you focus on you know the organic interactions that we received mm -hmm. Uh, for our brand and, you know, being able to tell our story to the consumers who were tasting our product. That's that's a much better interaction than to, let's say, sponsor a post on social media to people who probably won't even yeah. touch your product. Yeah. You know, like I like the, or the organic, natural, like, hey, if I'm using an influencer, you know, I know that the people who are following this influencer are being intentional about it. They're, mm -hmm. they're following your buns and similar buns. yeah similar likes mm -hmm. interests yeah because they like this so mm -hmm. you have to find that and build your brand around that i feel do you guys ever or like because bartenders obviously are the ones designing products or drinks with your ingredients in it um do you find that you have them i don't know maybe also help promote in a way like creating drinks or you know, showcasing the drinks that have been created with your, your product. Do you guys do that? We do. We try to do that. A lot of the times it's really tough because it's not a, a typical liquor brand. Mm -hmm. It's not a vodka. It's not a rum. Sure. It's a non-dairy coconut cream liqueur. It's a lot mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times bartenders are really, they're scared to kind of work with it. And mm -hmm. that's where we have to come along and kind of like educate. I can see that. That's why. I, yeah. That's why I said that. Yeah. My my business yeah. brain went, "Hey, yeah. <laughs> if these are the folks who are really at the end of the day, the consumer comes to that, yeah. to that counter, Absolutely. unless they know about your brand already. Mm -hmm. If they don't, that bartender is usually the one saying, hey, here's the top five drinks.' You know, that, those are the people who are introducing." Yeah at the purchase level, you know. Very organically as well. Yeah. And oh, yes, absolutely organic. Having a relationship with your bartenders yeah. in these bars and restaurants, it's super, it's key. Yeah. And we we tend to do that. So a lot of the times I like to keep the brand personal. Myself or my other two partners mm -hmm. will go to these bars and restaurants and will yeah. conversate with. Yeah. Because when do you see another liquor brand coming around and like the owner of the brand talking to the bartenders, telling them the story? They feel a connection to it. Yeah. And then they 
put that connection to the guests yeah. of one good point that does it is Barnaby's and Providence okay. and Los Andes and in, 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 uh, Providence. Mm-hmm. They do a very good job of telling our story when we're not around yeah. because we we treat them like family yeah. at the end of the day because they are. They're purchasing something and it's very sure. personal to us. What would you say uh, would be your best branding advice to somebody who is new, who is starting the, uh, the business? My biggest branding advice would be you have a story, all right? Don't force the story because when you force the story, people can tell. Um, you ha- It has to be an organic story. If you don't have a story, maybe you should go back to the drawing board. Uh, I think having a story with a brand uh, you need it. Just like you said, like you have no brand without the story. So that's number one. Also, really, really, really surround yourself with a great team. You, you're you going to have times where, you know, building your brand is going to be very taxing on you. Uh, your mental health is going to go through the roof and you're not going to know what mm-hmm. to do. So it's going to be very important to ground yourself with people who also have the same vision for your brand. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now, of course, you don't start with the team. You start with yourself. So Mm -hmm. focus on yourself in the beginning. But once you start to grow your your brand, you really want to make sure that you're being intentional with your hiring or bringing on partners. Because if they don't have the same mindset as you, you're just going to clash. Luckily, I don't clash with anybody on my team from my delivery drivers to my partners. We're all on the same team. Okay. So when we talked about, um, you know, putting together what your message was, you had mentioned website. So talk to us a little bit about what that process is, because I know it can be a little lengthy. So let's talk a little bit about how you came up with the design and the process of where you started to where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a man of many talents, but one thing for sure I'm not good at is website development, but it is a very important part of branding. Uh, so we did reach out to a marketing, a local marketing professional who assisted with the design and helped us capture everything that we wanted to say for our brand. Everything that is on the website is all from us, but the design aspect of it, you know, and how to capture the right tone all the 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 professional that that assisted us yeah uh so if you looked at the website like what it was when we first opened up the website it's nothing to what it's it looks like now we never had a store locator on there we didn't have our story it, we're always improving on the website when we first launched our website it was you know just a single image scroll down you know contact me at the bottom But now it's just been updated so many different times to where we're capturing more information, like capturing subscriptions, email subscriptions, Mm -hmm. capturing, you know, that actual hard data where we can start sending monthly um, campaigns to people. And that's really important for your brand because you always have to have the consumer thinking about your product. Yeah. Not only just your brand, but your business, because- using analytics tells you what's working, what isn't, right? Because we can all sit at the table and say, yeah, this is the thing that works, but it might not be the thing that works for your particular customer or your particular market or industry. So looking at your analytics will give you a lot of data and it can either confirm what you think, it'll say, or it'll say, no, you're wrong, right? And then I, I think many businesses go through many websites and continue to improve. So if you're just starting out, it is okay to start with a one page something. It's better than nothing, right? But then you go back and you look at it, right? Are you not getting the traffic that you thought you would? Maybe you got to look at your meta tags and your your search engine optimizations and what other features can you connect with through backlinks, et cetera. Like if you're in articles or you're on podcasts like this one, right? All those connections, right? We'll put the link from our podcast to your website. So people, you know, and just those back and forth links are another way, right? And once you optimize with SEO, it's going to all populate together. So when you look up on Google, Bobby Skokita, you're going to see everything. You're going to see Instagram, Facebook. Yes. You're going to see articles from Boston Globe. You're going to see Projo, ABC, Sills, you know? 
So I love that you brought that up. So all those things are going to show up at once, right? So the coconut logo is showing up on all of those platforms. Exactly. The colors, hopefully, are the same on all of those platforms. The font is on all of those all platforms, the right? Same. All the same message, right? You might have to tweak it based on the platform, on the way you deliver it, but it's the same story, yeah. right? And I think a lot of small businesses, when they start, it's not. So that would be one tip for sure would be, Go now, look up your website, look up your company, and look up what pops up, and then look at it from a branding eye. Yeah. Is it consistent? Does it tell the right story? Is it, And if it's not, clean it up. Yeah. Clean it up, right? But like you said, you worked really hard with a group, mm -hmm. a business development group, um, to make sure you got it right from the beginning. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your experience with the business group that you worked with. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a few different uh, professionals that we worked with. Uh, we worked with SBDC, we worked with Reba, and we worked with Trailblaze Marketing. So for folks who don't know those acronyms. Yes, Small Business <laughs> Development Center, uh, and then Rhode Island Black Business Association, then Trailblaze Marketing. Okay. Uh, you touched on so many great things that I feel like I also don't want to yeah. ask. Okay. Um, so in our brand book, uh, this is a book of our brand and everything yeah. that needs to be with our brand. We never stray from, if you look at our Instagram particularly, yep. our font is always the same. Our colors are always the same. You have to develop that brand and you can't stray from it. The thing that I see so many people do, mm -hmm. it's like making it look like a jumbled mess. When your brand doesn't have an identity, it could be really tough. So yeah. SBDC, uh, Small Business Development Center, and uh, Royal Island Black Business Association, they helped understand they helped me understand that uh and another thing was reba they put us through a pitch competition so it was myself and lewis almo the cfo who did the presentation uh there was six other entrepreneurs there uh you know pitching their elevator pitching their brand to a panel of judges mm -hmm. we happened to win first place and they gave us three thousand dollars as working capital um, they really helped us grow because they they told us about business planning. They told us about all these other things that were super important for building our foundation. And honestly, without it, it I don't know where we would be. Yeah. So that's that that's a great um, way to go about it. Doing a pitch competition if they have one in your area, your state, it would be something I would also recommend because it gives you an opportunity to one get really skilled at telling your story. Two people who are very experienced in business, and they very can they can quickly let you know whether your plan is good, viable, or if there are any gaps. And then I'm sure they gave feedback back to everybody, saying this was great. We look at this part, right? So even if you don't win, you really do win because you come away with so much more valuable information that can help you move your business forward. And then of course, if you win, that's awesome. You got some seed yeah. money to move to the next step, whatever, you know, whatever that is. And just make sure you do know your industry when going into these pitch competitions, because uh, there was actually one person on that panel who knew about the liquor industry and brand, liquor brand industry. Yep. And I bet they pummeled they you with questions. Us. I they bet they did. Us. So that's what they're there for, right? <laughs> exactly. And you, I hope you sent them a thank you basket. We after did. So <laughs> we worked with him through yeah. SBDC. His name was Manny Patel. Okay. Uh, he grilled us up there, but he ultimately was probably the deciding factor as to why we won because he understood that if you don't know your industry or your brand, that yeah. you're not going to make it. Yeah. And I, I, I found the same experience uh, for our business when we started. 16 years ago, we worked with Center for Women in Enterprise. We worked with Ocean State Business Development. Um, and then we worked with Bank RI. But um, yes, those processes definitely made a big difference in, um, you know, being successful. And uh, you can you can automatically know anyway who's going to be successful yeah. or not, right? Because if people get knocked off the bike and they get back on, they keep getting back on, eventually they, they win, right? Absolutely. So, um, I agree. yeah. So... Is there anything we didn't cover that you really think somebody should know? I mean, ultimately, I want to say you should congratulate yourself for taking that step on building your brand um, and always work with a professional in the beginning if you're not sure because we don't know everything. Um, as an entrepreneur, one of your many talents should be connecting with resources. You should always think about 
what resources do I have at my disposal mm -hmm. that can help me get to the next step without me spending so much time on it? Because mm -hmm. time, time is first, money. My, time is money. Mm -hmm. So when I'm, if I'm trying to build a website, it's going to take me so and so hours that I could be focusing on with branding or building my brand or you know, making new connections with connections. with <laughs> new people selling yeah. selling your product. Yeah, well, that's important. Yeah, so working with professionals for sure. Um, Cousin Vinny is not the marketing expert, so don't ask him at the Thanksgiving table if your logo is good to go. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so tell folks where they can find your fantastic product. Yeah, so we're in 60 different locations right now. Um, I would say just go to our website, bapiscoquito.com, scroll down to the store locator, and then you'll be able to find the closest location near you to grab a bottle. It's very delicious. One thing that I will say is it's great with espresso martinis as well. So okay. if you haven't, try it. Well, we're going to try it today. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on our show. I appreciate it. If you like the content in this video or you like Victor, who wouldn't like Victor, hit the subscribe button. Uh, make sure you check out his website. Next time you are at your restaurant, local restaurant or liquor store, ask if they have his product in stock. If they don't, make a fuss. <laughs> we appreciate your help, support. Have a great night. Bye bye. Are you a business owner? Are ready to get your startup? Well, started. Have a burning question you'd like us to answer? Want to know more about the services we offer? Or register for upcoming workshops and events? Looking to book a guest speaker? Or would like to be a guest on the Practical Biz podcast? Visit our website at stellabusinessconcepts.com.